Good morning, everyone. Would you stand with us, please? Two, three, four. today another beautiful end of summer Sunday to gather together if you are visiting with us this morning give you a special welcome we'd love to have you fill out that card in your bulletin and drop it in the box in the back or you can text MBC to the number in the back of your bulletin but so good to have you here today we have a number of things to announce so let's just get started the uh, men's and the ladies Bible studies have begun up again there's a men's study on Tuesday morning talk to Pastor Doug if you're interested about that, ladies, there's a Thursday morning and Thursday evening study. And men, there's another Thursday evening study you could talk to me about. But many ways to be involved. Ladies, just under a month from now is the ladies retreat. Sign up in the lobby 
And I was told that next Sunday is the last week to sign up for that. So make sure you sign up today or next week, ladies. This week, Awana starts back up on Tuesday evening at 6.55 to 8.30. We could still use some helpers with that. So if you'd like to help or want to know what would be involved in that, you could talk to Russ this morning or Jagger in the lobby after service. Now, I would encourage you to, to read your bulletin. You notice in the bottom left of there, there's like five or six upcoming events. So take note of those, the ones that apply to you, mark them down in your calendar. Let me just mention some of these dates. October 14th, men, we have another men's breakfast. So mark that down in your calendar. Um, there's going to be the grandparent seminar again this fall, October 19th and 20th. October 20th, there's also going to be a Friday night. There'll be a family fun night here at the church that Jagger's putting together of all sorts of fun games and activities for the whole family. Uh, October 28th, Trunk and Treat, and then November 10th, Pioneer Bible Camp. So mark calendars on things that apply. Next Sunday morning, after or at the end of the service, we will have uh, some baptisms. And if you are a Christian, if you have trusted Christ alone for salvation, you have not been baptized, it's not how we're saved or, or add to our salvation, but a step of obedience, um, it's something to consider. You can talk to me, talk to Doug about that, but next Sunday we'll have a baptismal service. Last thing, we do have small groups coming up. This will be the last Sunday in the lobby to sign up for those. So put your name down there if you'd like to be part of a small group. A lot going on in the ministry, a lot to be involved with. A lot to be in prayer for as we serve the Lord together. Let's pray as we continue our service. Lord, as we just sang, you truly are an awesome God. You are the eternal one, the self-sufficient one, Lord, the everlasting God. Lord, you are the creator of all things. You're the sustainer of all things. You are the mover and the active one in history, moving all things towards your appointed end. We give you praise for your greatness and your power, Lord. Your greatness is unsearchable. Lord, you're also a personal God, though, who created us to have fellowship with you. And when we sinned, you sent your Son to be the Savior, to suffer and die on the cross, to pay in full the penalty for our sins, to rise again, to sit at your right hand even today. He's coming back someday. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. Lord, do you thank you for your goodness and grace today that's brought each and every one of us here together today. Lord, may it be a time of encouragement as we sing your truth, as we look at your word. May your spirit take it. May you open our eyes to see wonderful things from it. May you change us to be more and more like the image of your son. We ask that this would happen, that you would be honored, that we would be blessed. We pray in your son's name. Amen. Again, if you're able, would you stand with us, please? One, two, three. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Oh, Lord, we praise your name. Oh, Lord, we magnify.
seated. Tim, thank you for those selections. I was looking over the order of service, and I do that. Tim generally sends it. I give him an idea of what we're looking for, and I thought, Tim really hit a bottom of the ninth grand slam home run with the songs that he picked because they're going to dovetail beautifully with our message this morning. If you have a Bible, I want you to locate, if you would, please, The Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. You say, Doug, I've never heard of the book of Ecclesiastes. Well, don't be embarrassed because chances are the person next to you doesn't know where it is either. So here's what I want you to do. If you go to the center of your Bible, chances are good that you'll find the book of Psalms, which is the largest book in our Bible, 150 chapters. And if you'll work your way towards the New Testament, just about 20, 25 pages or so, you'll come to the book of Ecclesiastes. And if you go to the Song of Solomon, you've gone too far, or the book of Isaiah. Now that will help you find the book of Ecclesiastes if you're using an old-fashioned Bible. If you're using something electronic, it's probably going to be a piece of cake for you to find. Amen. But what I want to do this morning is I want to read the first 11 verses of this book, because we are going to embark upon a series of messages from this book. And I've got to tell you, I am absolutely excited and ecstatic about going through this book. We're not going to go through it verse by verse. We're going to address it thematically. I promise to be done within four or five months, okay? But It is a wonderful book, and it's a book that speaks to the issues of our day. Now, let me mention one other thing before I read the Scripture, and that is I'm going to, for this series, be using a new translation. In the past, for the last 10 years since I've been at this church, I have used the New International Version. But for this series, I'm going to use the English Standard Version, and there's a number of reasons for that. I'm not going to go into them at this time, but uh, if you want to know my reasons for doing so, uh, send it in an email. No, no, no. But (laughs) some of you know where I was going with that. But um, I think that this will be a translation that we'll all benefit from and I I think you will be blessed in the reading of God's Word this morning. And if you are able, in honor of the reading of God's Word, if you would please stand as I read Ecclesiastes 1, verses 1 through 11. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity, vanity of vanities. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes, 
and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises, the sun goes down, and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the places where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, See, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. This is God's inspired, instructive, helpful, and relevant word to our time and needs this day. You may be seated. Mid Valley Bible Church is very, very blessed to have come out of our fellowship a number of people who are serving God in the mission field. Last week, we were blessed to have chaplains with us. And this morning, providentially, it just so happens that we have another one of our missionaries with us, and that's Chris Linty. And I'm going to ask Chris to come at this time and just share briefly a little about his ministry there. And then I'm also going to have Russ Anderson. Russ, why don't you come up at the same time with him? After Chris shares, uh, Russ is going to take one minute. Russ is going to take one minute and present Chris with his citation award for Awana. And Chris, you were saying that it took how many years for you to get this or to at least be recognized for it? A while. 20. Didn't you tell me? That's two decades, right? Yes. So, right. all right. Share with us, please. Okay, we're going to mix it up a little bit and we're going to do the Awana presentation. He doesn't first. follow directions. No. <laughs> I learned from the best. Anyway, um, Chris first came to Utah, and when he first came to Utah, he'd already been involved in the Iwana Club over in Cedar Ridge, Colorado, and when he came, he continued in that ministry, and while he was here, he was even a leader after he graduated high school, and um, after he stayed with me for a, a while, then he um, was, a, his roommate was Jesse Hornock, and so he st stayed around and all that kind of stuff, but a few years ago, he told me he wanted to finish all the books in the Iwana program so he could get his citation award. And he only had two TNT books left. And so we started a Zoom discipleship call <laughs> so he could finish his um, Iwana material. And it's because of that I am here up front with a suit and tie so I can present him an Iwana citation. <laughs> so... Um, and then I'm going to do a transition, then we'll sit down. Chris, on behalf of the Mid Valley Bible Church, I want to ministry, I present to you a citation award. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, now to keep it short, um, Chris and his wife, Nui, who's sitting in the back, um, they have prayer cards, and on there is all the information you need to know if you missed Sunday school. All you need to know about their current um, global ministries that they're involved in. And so on behalf of Chris and his wife, Nui, pray for them and talk to them about picking up a card that has more information about their ministry. And feel free to talk to them or anybody that was in Sunday school. Okay, did we keep our two minutes? <laughs> no, oh, but that's okay. I need you to, you're going to share briefly. Just tell us a little bit about your ministry for those who weren't there. Okay. 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 First off, I'd just like to thank my mother, my family, my friends, <laughs> all my supporters. This is for you. Okay, now you can have it. 
Okay, so I've been in Thailand for almost 23 years. I've made a 50-year commitment to the nation when I first went in 2001. So 23 years down, 27 to go. And the, my time in Thailand is committed to ministering to men around the world through the ministry of MST, which stands for Mentoring Men, Strengthening Marriages, and Teaching Truth. And what our whole hope is to bring uh, help, hope, and healing to men, whatever issues they're going through, either as single men or married men, to help them learn what it means to be a man of God according to his word, his ways, and his will. It's a lifelong discipleship commitment to each and every man, and so we would appreciate your prayers as we remain faithful and obedient to all that God leads us to do and entrusts us to do as well. And as Russ was so kind to say, we have a prayer card. I believe it's frameable. That's how beautiful it is. So I'd uh, encourage you to come and get one. My wife is there in the back with Russ, and she has them, or you can come to me, and we'd love to bless you with that and give you more information on how you can learn about the work of MST worldwide. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Now let's pray together. Father, we thank you again for the ministry that you have led Chris to. We thank you that in a very real sense, he, as all disciples of Christ are, a true trophy of your grace. And Father, his life takes on special significance when we see the way that you have worked in his life in such a powerful way in transforming him. We're grateful as well for the role that Mid Valley Bible Church has played in his growth and development and the ministry that you've called him to. And Father, not only in the presence of these people, but also in your presence, I want to thank you for the ministry that Russ Anderson has had in his life and the impact that he has made not only in Chris's life, but in the lives of literally thousands of people down through his many years through the Awana program. And I pray that you would bless him for his faithfulness in serving you. And as we embark this Tuesday upon our Awana program, we pray that we would realize that we are dealing with uh, young people, boys and girls, whose lives can be truly impacted with the truth of the gospel. And we pray that as they commit themselves to Scripture memory, that, Father, they would take your word, that they would hide it in their hearts, so that they would have victory over sin. And I pray, Lord, that you would bring many, many children to our Awana program this coming Tuesday, that we would also have an abundance of leaders. We pray that you would continue to bless Mid-Valley Bible Church, and we thank you for your faithfulness as we embark upon the beginning of our 71st year. And I pray, Lord, that you would just bless us as a church, continue to give us unity, continue to give us direction, continue to give us that sense of full and complete commitment to the truths that are found in your word. We pray that we would never waver from them. Help us to have the wisdom to discern what are the issues that we need to be fighting for and standing for, firm upon. And Father, those that are really secondary, Lord, that is indeed a great challenge at times. And we are grateful, Father, that you've provided us that wisdom in the past, and we would pray that it would continue to the future. We pray for those who are here this morning who are going through difficult times, and I pray that you would bless them, that you would encourage them through your word. For those, Father, who are in need of physical healings, I pray, the Lord, that you as the great physician would touch their bodies and that you would make them well. And for those who are struggling with personal issues, whether they're emotional or spiritual, I pray that you would minister to them as well. We pray that we would look upon each person that we greet as a special child of yours and someone who might need that word of encouragement. They might need that pat on the back or a hug or just a, a time to let them know that we're caring for them and that we pray for them. Lord, I pray that you would just continue to bless our nation as well. We pray for our president, give him safety as he returns back to the United States from his trip overseas. We pray that you would give him the discernment needed to govern our nation in a God-honoring way. Draw him, we pray, to yourself in salvation. May he realize, as all people need to realize, that before God they are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins, and that their only hope for eternal life and the forgiveness of sins is not found in a church or in one's good works, but rather it's found in the finished and completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross. We pray, Father, that you would cause our hearts this morning, as we look into your word, to be open to what you desire to teach us. 
And we pray as God's people towards that end, in Jesus' name. And everybody agreed and said, amen. At this time, we'll, we, we will be dismissing our children to kick kids in church. And this is a new tune to an old lovely hymn. And I'll be honest to say, it's one of the most worshipful pieces of music that I've had the privilege of arranging and singing.
There is an old story of a Jewish rabbi who lived in a Russian village at the end of the 19th century who sadly became overwhelmingly disappointed by life's seeming lack of direction and purpose. One evening he wandered out into the night with his hands thrust deep into his pocket, wondering aimlessly as he walked the empty streets of the village in which he lived. And as he did so, he began to question his faith in God. He began to honestly wonder whether there was a God. He began to doubt the Scriptures and his calling to ministry. And in a very real sense, he was a man living his life on the sloping back of a question mark. The only thing colder than the Russian winter air was the chill deep within his own soul. Overwhelmed by his own despair, he mistakenly wandered into a restricted area on a Russian military compound, an area that was off limits to civilians. A Russian soldier shattered the silence of the evening chill with the loud cry of, Who are you? And what are you doing here? The soldier's loud, thundering voice brought the rabbi back to reality. But it's also his question that brought him to his senses. And he said, excuse me? And the soldier said, I said, who are you and what are you doing here? And after a brief moment, the rabbi, in a gracious tone, so as not to provoke the soldier, asked, how much do you get paid every day? (laughs) And the soldier retorted, what does that have to do with you? And this rabbi, this rabbi with the delight of someone making a new discovery said, I will pay you the equal sum if you will ask me those two questions every day. Who are you and what are you doing here? You know, it seems to me that those two questions are absolutely fundamental They're absolutely foundational for every person to both ask and answer. But here's where the difficulty lies. Once those two questions are asked and answered, the challenging questions of life are not over. They're not over because largely in part we remain a sinful people living in a sinful world And sadly, sometimes things become even more complicated. What happens is we try to match the facts of faith to the facts of life, and sometimes the facts of faith come out on the short end of the stick. And I want to suggest this morning that that's really where the book of Ecclesiastes comes in. What I want to do for the next few months is look at this book in a series of messages that I'm entitling simply The Search for Life's Meaning. And of all the series that I've done, this is the one that I've got to tell you I'm most excited about. I've never preached on the book of Ecclesiastes, so I decided that before I end my tenure, it'd be wise for me to at least take a stab at it. Because what you find here is a writer being honest about life's troubles. The book of Ecclesiastes is a book that touches the heart of people who struggle, and who among us doesn't? It has a way of speaking to the issues of the day, any day. And it's a book that if you've read it, You know that the author does not hide his own sins, his own shortcomings, misgivings, uncertainties, doubts, and his disillusionments with life. And as you read this book, you find that the author pours out his soul for 12 chapters. So as much as anything, Ecclesiastes is a book for people who have have their doubts about God. 
but they can't stop thinking about God. They know He exists. They know He's supposed to be a good, gracious, and loving God. But they have their doubts. And that was the case of the author of this this book. And with those doubts, he was enabled to speak to skeptics as well as believers down through the centuries. See, one of the things that the book of Ecclesiastes doesn't try to do is give us all neat, tidy answers in a box with a bow on top. It's a book where life's limitations are admitted at the outset. You know, as I was thinking about that, some books are like that. They admit at the outset their limitations, their shortcomings, their their, their way that they're not going to be able to answer every question that people have. The author admits that. He admits it right at the outset. He, He says that the answer to life's questions are sort of like chasing the wind. And that desperate image of chasing the wind helps us to understand this book. Ecclesiastes is not the kind of book that we keep reading until we reach the end and all of a sudden we have all of the answers to life's problem. It's not like a murder mystery where when you come to the final chapter you find that it was Professor Plum who committed the murder in the library with a lead pipe. Instead, it's a book where you keep struggling with the problems of life And as you struggle, you learn in the end that the only way to survive, the only way to make it in this sin-troubled world is to trust God, to trust Him with the questions even when we don't have the answers. That's really how the whole of the Christian life works, is it not? It's not just about what we get at the end. But it's also the person we become along the way. See, one of the things that I think this book teaches us is that discipleship is a journey, not a destination. And that's key. There's a process that we all go through in life, and we never come to that point in our life where we say, all right, I've arrived, I have it all put together. And if you are that person this morning, please, please introduce yourself to me. Because I want to put you in the Guinness Book of World Records. And what I want to do this morning is I want to introduce us to this book. And then what I want to do is look briefly at the first 11 verses of this book. But let's start with the title, okay? Ecclesiastes. What exactly does that mean? You know, as you think about the books in our Bible, it's easy, under, easy to understand why some books are named as they are. For example, Genesis means beginning. And it's pretty obvious why that's the first book in our Bible. The last book, the book of the Revelation, speaks of the last revelation of Jesus Christ. It was given to John on the island of Patmos, and we talked about that last week. And it's not hard to figure out why the 64 books in between the first and the last book in our Bible are called what they are, with the exception of Ecclesiastes. That's a difficult name. So why do we call it that? Well, I want you to notice the opening verse of this book. Your Bible should be open to Ecclesiastes 1. And notice what it says. It says, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. If you're here this morning using a King James, a new King James, the NIV, it too will say the words of the preacher. If you're using a new American standard, it will say the words of the teacher. But I want you to look at that word preacher for a moment. It's the Hebrew word koheleth. 
And as a noun, it means a preacher, a teacher, a person who speaks in an assembly. It's also used to refer to a person who was a collector of sentences and sayings and proverbs. It's a word that's used some seven times exclusively in the book of Ecclesiastes. And if you're a stickler for verses, it's found in verse 1, verse 2, verse 12 of chapter 1, verse 27 of chapter 7, verse 8 of chapter 12, and also found in verse 9. And as a verb, the word means to speak so as to bring people together. You say, all right, Doug, that's great. Wonderful Hebrew lesson. I'll be able to help that tomorrow morning when I have that battle of mind over mattress, and I've got to get up and go to work. But that doesn't answer the question, how did they get the name Ecclesiastes? Well, when the Hebrew Bible was translated or transcribed from Hebrew to Greek in what was known as the Septuagint, which was essentially the translation of the 70, the 70 scholars got together. And the particular word that they used for preacher was this word. And it's the word from which we get the word Ecclesiastes. And so Ecclesiastes is simply the transliteration of the Greek word for preacher. And I suppose if they wanted to translate it, it instead of transliterating it, they could have simply called the book the preacher, or the teacher, the collector, or the guy who talks to people. Second question is, who exactly was this guy? Well, the author never really gives us his name. Instead, he simply calls himself the preacher or the koheleth, the teacher or the preacher. But again, who exactly was he? Well, friend, I want to suggest this morning, and I would argue quite vociferously, that given the many hints that are found in this book, it's not that difficult to nail down who it was that wrote it. For example, you will notice in verse 1, it says that he's the son of David, king in Jerusalem. In verse 12, he's the one who had been king over Israel in Jerusalem. In verse 6 of chapter 1, he's the one who had acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. In chapter 2, verses 4 through 8, it speaks of the author's wealth, the number of slaves that he had, the harem that was his. And he says in verse 9, so I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. And friend, I could give you another dozen or so hints as to who this man was. But I believe that when you put it all together, the only individual who fits this description is King Solomon. Additionally, that was the tradition of Jewish rabbis, the church fathers, and for centuries that was the position of the church. They, they said that it was Solomon and yet today I find it fascinating how many scholars sort of scoff at that notion. And sadly, even some evangelicals are in that camp. And what they do is they say that this book was written by a, a fictional biographer. In other words, there was this unknown author who reportedly, through the mouth of Solomon, though he wasn't Solomon, wrote this book. And i got to tell you, I, I remain unpersuaded by these arguments. And so I want to suggest that despite the fact that the author's name is never given, he calls himself simply the preacher or the teacher, friend, I know of no good reason not to accept the strong tradition of the church, the position of the early fathers, as well as the internal evidence that I think is overwhelming, that would suggest that Solomon was the one who wrote this. And if you think it through, that's quite significant. Because who was Solomon? 
Well, friend, he was the wisest man who ever lived. He had money and power. He could try anything and everything in life for fulfillment and satisfaction, which he did. And because Solomon had all of that, you and I would be wise to take to heart what he says regarding the meaning as well as the meaninglessness of life. Now, there's one more key point that I want to make, and it's simply this. And that is, when did he write this? Well, I think as you read this book, it's pretty clear that he wrote it when he was old. And he's looking back, as it were, over life. And he's telling people, can I just share with you what I've learned? He's pulling his children, his grandchildren, his great-great-grandchildren to himself and anybody else who would listen. And he's saying, can I just share with you what I've learned? What, what you find here in a very real sense is what we might call Solomon's personal journal. Now, the next important question is, how should we approach this book? Well, some have suggested that we should approach it as what he writes here as being the philosophy of a man without God. This is a book, if you're familiar with it, that's sort of the viewpoint of the atheist or the agnostic. The person who doesn't believe there's a God or says we can't or don't know. This person would say there's no divine purpose to life. There's no such thing as providence. Life is a crapshoot. And it's not until the last chapter that the writer comes to his senses and he finds meaning to life through a personal relationship with God. But prior to that, he says life is meaningless. It's purposeless. It's all vanity. Others have suggested that this is the philosophy of life from the side of a backslidden believer. They would say that what you see here is Solomon confessing his own personal sinful experiences. Familiar with the life of Solomon, you know that he had a boatload, especially during the latter years of his reign when wealth and women turned him from God. And in the end, when he comes to chapter 12, he repents and he comes back to God and all is good. But you know, this morning, I'm going to suggest, and we're going to take a slightly different approach from those two, because I want to suggest that Solomon is sharing not the philosophy of life of an unbeliever or that of a backslidden Christian, but rather Solomon is telling us what life really is like for all of us. And what he's talking about here is the many different enigmas and dilemmas that we all face in life, whether we're a believer or a non-believer. He's talking about the fate of the spiritual as well as the carnal. He's talking about the fate of the mature as well as the immature. In other words, I want to suggest that this book is describing the very essence of the human condition. And so, what then is the theme of the book? What's the book all about? Well, friend, I want to suggest that Ecclesiastes records the struggles that every thinking man or woman has ever experienced who's tried to square his faith with the facts of life. And that's not an easy thing to do. And yet, in spite of the difficulties, in spite of all the unanswered questions, all the intellectual potholes that are along life's road, all of the apparent futility that we go through from time to time, one of us needs to work our way through that and find in what's needed is a reverent trust in God. And the best way to see this 
theme is to look at the introduction of this book as well as its conclusion. Because you will notice that in the introduction to this book, we find a gaunt and stark announcement where the writer of this book says in verse 2, vanities of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Some of your translations might render that verse meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Eugene Peterson expresses it in his paraphrase called The Message by simply saying it's all smoke. That's what life is. It's, it's a vapor, it's smoke. Here one moment, gone the next. Now that is something you see, by the way, throughout the book. He says over and over again, everything is meaningless, everything is vanity. And he applies it to life and death, wealth and poverty, wisdom and foolishness. And in the end, in the conclusion, he comes back to that very same statement. Because what he says in verse 12 of, of verse 8, rather, of chapter 12, is he says, vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. But then he goes on and he says this. He says, besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. He says in verse 10, the preacher sought to find words of delight and uprightly he wrote words of truth. I, I think Solomon here is talking about the book of Proverbs that he had a major hand in writing. And then he says in verse 11, as he closes out his personal journal, he says, the words of the wise are like goads. Now, a goad was simply a tool that was used by a shepherd to deal with wayward sheep. We might think of it as a staff, maybe more like a belly club, okay? You know, sometimes sheep need a belly club. He says, the words of the wise are like Goads and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. And then he says in verse 12, My son, be aware of anything beyond these, of making many books there is no end, and much study is weariness of the flesh. He's saying, you know, as I wrote what I wrote, in the words of Howard Cosell, I wanted to tell it like it is. But then he comes to his conclusion. This is, this is his final answer. He says in, in verse 13, The end of the matter, all has been heard. And here's what it is. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. In other words, what Solomon is saying here is this. Even if life seems meaningless, even if life seems like vanity, vanities, even if life seems like just a smoke vapor. It's an accurate picture. Even with all of that being true, Solomon says, truly the wise person is going to be the one who will fear God and continue to obey Him, even though he doesn't have all the answers. For this is this preacher's final answer. And because it's his final answer, no matter what he said prior to this, no other statement in the book should be interpreted in a way that contradicts that final answer. Namely, that the duty of man is to fear God, to keep His commandments. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. And here's what's important. You and I are going to see as we go through this book in the coming weeks that Solomon, 
is dropping hints throughout the book, throughout his journal, giving us clues as to this final answer. That fearing God and keeping His commandments is the key to living life. In other words, it seems to me that the overall point here in this first chapter is that the key to living life, the Son, that has been lost because of sin and produces at times a sense of futility and meaningless, is found when even though we don't have all the answers to life, in God. What Solomon is saying in the opening of this book is that vanity of vanities, all is vanities. And even though life at times seems empty and transitory and purposeless, and there are many questions with few answers, that doesn't mean that we throw in the towel that we quit, and that we live a life of cynicism and pessimism. Contrary to what some people think, the book of Ecclesiastes is not the rallying cry for cynics. It's not the rallying cry of the pessimist, the person who's so sarcastic that he can't even think straight. You know what the, the writer here is telling us? The key to life under the sun, a phrase, by the way, that's used 25 times in this book, has been lost, and it's lost because of sin. It's been lost because Adam and Eve rebelled in the Garden of Eden, and you and I carry that old sin nature within, and we're subjected to futility that's described in Romans 8, 18 through 25. That doesn't mean that we quit, that we give up. Friend, what we do is we continue on. And I think the reason most people struggle with this preacher is because he's more honest than most. Say, what exactly do you mean, Doug? I want you to listen carefully. Friend, all of our lives we've been led or allowed to think and to act as though Christianity is not only the remedy to man's sin problem, which it is, And that Christianity is not only the way to heaven, which it is, and that Christianity is not only the most fulfilling life possible for a man on earth, which it is, but friend, we've also been told that Christianity provides an instant solution to life's enigmas, and it does not. It does not. Preachers, and I put myself in this category, have often been guilty of implying, if not teaching directly, that if you become a Christian, what happens? All of your problems are solved. You know, you'll have peace with God in your heart, and you'll have no unanswered questions, no feelings of despair, no feelings of insignificant, no feelings of worthlessness, and All the enigmas that are ours in the universe will be solved. Friend, that's not true. Because if we're honest with ourselves, all of us have moments of despair and loneliness. And friend, there are ultimately questions that we cannot answer. And if we pretend to have all the answers, we know in our hearts that they really don't satisfy. I've discovered in my time as being a pastor that sometime I'm supposed to be the answer man. People have challenges in their lives and I'm supposed to provide the answer. Why did this tragedy happen to me or to my loved one? Why am I going through this difficulty? And friend, I've got to tell you, sometimes I don't have a clue. There are enigmas in life. Let me see if I can illustrate my point. Please, please, don't walk out on me, okay? After this illustration, please don't walk out and say, I'm never coming back to Mid-Valley Bible Church. 
Because I want for a moment you to take two issues that are hot, bad issues, hot buttons, and that is the issue of predestination or free will and human responsibility and God's sovereignty. Friend, those two issues are among the many great mysteries of God. And every thinking Christian has struggled or will struggle with that issue. As we desire to understand those two truths and reconcile them together. And every once in a while, you'll find someone who writes a book. And they want to charge you $25 or $30 for it. And they'll say, I've got the answer to that problem. And what you discover when you read the book carefully is that they haven't found the key. What they've done is they've actually changed the lock. And they've distorted what the Bible teaches about God's sovereignty. Or they've massaged man's responsibility to the point where biblical authors wouldn't even recognize it. And the fact of the matter is that for some, changing the lock is easier than finding a lost key. But it doesn't solve the problem. You know, I've been doing this long enough to know that there is no key available that will satisfy and satisfactorily unlocked the enigma of God's sovereignty and human responsibility. And part of the problem is we're dealing with two universes. We're dealing with God's and ours. We're dealing with the transcendent as well as the eminent. We're dealing with the timeless as well as the time-bound. And the truth of the matter is that we must be willing to live with the dilemmas and the enigmas of life until at the time of our death or when Jesus returns, we become like Him, for we will see Him as He is. Now, friend, I've got to tell you, I'm, I'm content to live that way. I'm not suggesting that we don't try to find solution to some of these problems. I'm not suggesting that there aren't issues out there that you and I will come to terms with and be at peace with. But what I am saying is that it's impossible by the very nature of the problem to grasp it fully because you know what? You're not God. And if we're really honest, there are some unanswered and unanswerable questions to some of the questions of life. There are some things in this life that don't make sense. And sometimes you will, in frustration, say, I don't know what in the world is going on. And friend, I want to suggest that it's wrong that we give people unrealistic expectations to suggest that we have all the answers and we've got our life all put together. And to demonstrate that reality. What Solomon does is he demonstrates this troubling reality that is ours, this side of eternity. And, he, and, and Solomon takes us on an excursion through the many aspects of life that are troubling to us all. He talks about wisdom and knowledge and power and money and pleasure all of the things that we pursue in an attempt to find satisfaction. And Solomon, in the end, is going to say, they don't satisfy, they don't work. And what you have to do as you go through this book is you have to again and again and again go back to his final answer. Remember what it was? It's fear God, keep his commandments. Because in the end, God is going to make everything right Good deeds, bad deeds, everything is going to be judged. And what Solomon does in the opening chapter is he starts by asking a question. And the question is simply this, what does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? 
And then what he does in verses 4 through 11 is he makes the case for the weary emptiness of life where the earth, the air, the sun, and the water, and even people do the same thing again and again and again. It's like living life on a, on a treadmill or being a hamster in one of those cages where he's just rolling all the time. And there's never any real change anywhere that takes place. What Solomon says is that generations come and go, but the earth doesn't move. He says in verses 4 through 11, the sun rises and it sets, it rises and sets, it rises and sets. He says the wind, it just goes around and around in circles. He says the water forever flows into the sea and it's the same as it ever was. And he says the same is true of human nature. And so why bother? Why, why keep running on this treadmill of our existence? And Solomon says that what we need to do is we just need to keep trusting in God. Solomon, as it were, is throwing in our face that very important question. And when he says what he says in verses 4 through 11, he's not suggesting that there hasn't been progress in our world. Wish we had the time to go through this verse by verse, but we don't. But Solomon is not saying that there hasn't been advances that have taken place technologically or in medicine or in transportation or communication. But what he's saying here, as far as those things meeting the needs of people and satisfying them, he said, all of that is meaningless and emptiness. It's all smoke and mirrors. If I can put it in terms, hopefully most of you will understand. Happiness and purpose of life is not found in front of a computer screen. Friend, there's more chaos, more confusion, more lack of hope and direction than ever. So what's the answer? Where do we go? Well, if there's no meaning under the sun, our only hope is to go above it. What he says at the end of the book applies to the beginning. And what he says in verse 1 of chapter 12 is what we need to do is remember the Creator in the days of our youth. He says, before evil days come and years draw near, where someone will say, I have no pleasure in them. Friend, I want to suggest that Solomon in this book is trying to expose the futility of human life under the sun so as to create a hunger for something better. And that something better is God. Again, remember the preacher's ultimate conclusion? Remember his final answer? He says, fear God, keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Why? Because in the end, God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. And friend, what I'm saying in the introduction to this book is simply this. This side of eternity we are not going to be given the key to life. But here's what we do have. We have good reason to trust the locksmith. And so what we need to do is work our way through this book. And what we're going to discover is that the author of this book gives us plenty of reasons to fear God, to enjoy life, and to realize that ultimately in the end, God is going to make everything right when He judges people. And the problem is we become so tethered to this earth and we struggle with the futility and the meaningless of life under the sun. And what I'm saying this morning is that if you're here and you're a skeptic regarding Christianity, I'm not going to tell you that if you become a Christian this morning, all of life's problems are solved because they're not. 
But I do know how you can become personally acquainted with the locksmith. And that is God Almighty. And that is what you need to do is you need to put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. And you don't come on your own terms, you come on His. Jesus Christ said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. And the Bible says that He died on the cross to pay for your sins, my sins, the sins of the entire world. He became the bridge, the chasm between a, a, a holy God and sinful man. And He offers to us the free gift of eternal life to anyone who will believe, anybody who will trust Him as their Savior. So if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus Christ, we'd invite you to do so. You say, Doug, what hand should I raise? Do I need to walk an aisle? Do I need to join the church? Do I need to be baptized? No, you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, recognizing that before God you're a sinner and Jesus died on the cross for you. And then you continue to live a life of faith and trust and obedience in Him. Not that you're going to have all the answers to life, and that's going to be clear when we go through this book of Ecclesiastes. But we continue to trust God, who is the locksmith, and He is the one who has the key to unlock that lock. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful that while we don't have the answers to all the enigmas of life, you do. We realize that we oftentimes would like to have the blueprint to this universe, to know the details of your plan for the future. But in your wisdom, you've chosen not to reveal those things to us. Your word says the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and our sons forever. And you have revealed to us all we really need to know. And you've revealed clearly your plan of salvation. So I pray if there's anyone here this morning who's yet to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior, that they would do so. We pray that you would draw them to yourself. For those of here, us here who know you as our Savior, I pray, Lord, that you would help us each and every day to live a life of faith. Not a life of arrogance. Not a life where we act as though we have all the answers to the enigmas of life. But, Father, we're living a life of obedience and trust in you. And we pray these things now in Jesus' wonderful and glorious name. And all God's people agreed and said, Amen. Let's stand and we'll sing. In His time, in His time, He makes all things beautiful. You know, I've been talking primarily this morning to people who know Jesus Christ as their own Savior, but if you're here, as I mentioned at the end, you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, we have a little book entitled, How to Begin the Christian Life. It's our gift to you. Copies of it are available, not only in the lobby at the Information Center, but also right there at the back of the church. There's a stack available. If you've never picked one of these up and read it before, you might find it helpful and beneficial. Maybe you could share it with somebody else who's just getting started with their walk with Christ and the Christian faith. 
pick it up. It's our gift to you. And inside there is my contact information. And we'd love to help you grow in your walk with Christ. Maybe you have questions. I don't have all the answers to life's questions, but I do have the answer to the question, how do I get to heaven? How do I become a member of God's family? Friend, on that question, I can speak with absolute authority and absolute confidence because everything I'm going to share with you is based upon this book. And so if you're still in that process of thinking things through, please give us the joy, give us the privilege, give us the delight of sharing those truths with you this morning. Father, thank you again for our morning together. Thank you for these precious, precious people who've committed themselves to spend an hour, hour and a half with us and to listen and to be ever so respectful and attentive. And I pray, Lord, that as the seed was sown this morning, that you would cause it to spring forth to life eternal. And for those of us who know Christ as their Savior, I pray that this would have been a helpful introduction to this book. And then each one of us in the weeks to come would spend some time reading this book and trying to gain a fuller and more complete understanding of some of the enigmas of life and what Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, had to say about them. Dismiss us now with your richest of blessings. We ask that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and communion of God's Spirit would be with us now as we go out into the world. For we ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people agreed and said, Amen.